if I start by telling you that the camera in my hand does 24 frame per second burst shooting as well as 4K video using picture profiles including S-Log2, you may be forgiven by being surprised at its size. This tiny powerhouse is the Sony RX100 V. It's got pretty much the same feature set as the A6000 series and the A7 series. What it doesn't have are interchangeable lenses, and its 20 megapixel 1 inch sensor is smaller than the sensor in those models. It has inherited all the good things from its predecessors and extended family, and sets new standards for focus and burst speeds. Previous RX100 models have only had contrast detection for focus, not that there's anything wrong with that, but the addition of phase detection with 315 points here make it super fast and super accurate. High speed burst now fires off 24 frames per second into a buffer that holds 155 11 meg extra fine JPEGs in six and a half seconds. Dial down to fine JPEGs at six megs and the buffer still dries up around 160. Dial up to 20 meg raw plus 5 meg JPEGs, and the rate remains at 24, but the buffer fills in under 3 seconds with 63 images. The downside, after the buffer is filled, it takes up to a minute to save all the files. You can snap a few frames, but can't access the menu. There's no SD card status light, so press play, and you'll see the buffer status in the top left. Push those 20 megapixel images into a video file, and you've got a 6 second video with a resolution of about 6K. Initially, I thought 1 inch sensors were on the small side, but I've now taken so many great photos with them, even in the dark, that I've come around. It's a sleek design, it fits in a pocket, a purse, or you can carry it in your hand. It comes with a wrist strap for an easy carry. This is the fifth generation RX100 I've reviewed, and I never hesitate to bring it along, although I wouldn't mind a little more grippy front. The compact size hides a bright OLED viewfinder, although it's slightly cumbersome to activate, push the lever, pull the lens. Diopter on top, which accommodates my prescription. Popping it up turns the camera on, retracting powers off, but that can be customized if you'd like to retract the viewfinder without powering down. The lens pops out quickly when powered on. It's an f1.8 24-70mm equivalent, which ramps to f2.8 when zoomed in. Closest focus about 5cm, which makes it reasonable for macro work. The multifunction stepless lens ring, the current function is displayed on screen, is useful as there are no other dials to set aperture, shutter speed, or focus. The ring zooms in some modes, and there is a zoom lever around the shutter button. I wouldn't mind a stepped option, both to make adjusting aperture clearer and also to reduce accidental adjustments. The mode dial is small, and I'm not sure why HFR is independent of movie mode, it's combined on other models, and why panorama can't be combined with scene. But although competitors are getting close, Sony's panorama mode remains the industry's best. Also on top, a flash release with an unspecified guide number can be tilted back for a bounce. The LCD flips 180 degrees, and when you take a selfie, there's a three second countdown. Nice. Swivels down for overhead shots, still not a touchscreen. There are three non-customizable buttons and one customizable button around the multi-controller dial. I wish more Sony models had the menu button so easily accessible with the right hand. It is a kind of a point and shoot camera and auto mode works well. It has a hidden feature which has now been removed from other Sony models. Both the A6000 series and RX10 series used to have this. In auto mode, press down on the control ring and a novice shooting menu appears to adjust aperture for background blur, brightness, color temperature, saturation, and a few special effects, although not my favorites. But let's leave auto mode and check the default settings. By default, JPEG quality is fine. I prefer extra fine or raw plus JPEG to do some fine tuning in Lightroom. Note that in raw plus, 
JPEG is fine. So let's go back to focus for a minute because the lack of touch makes setting a focus point, if you like that kind of thing, a little more difficult than it needs to be. Press the fun button to choose one of five focus modes, single, and auto which senses movement and adjusts, continuous, manual, and direct manual to set the focus with auto and then make manual adjustments. Should I point out that the fun menu has two modes, turn the dial to select or press the dial for the menu version, which offers additional press right options on some features. The fun menu can be customized with most used options. If you set all the lower options to not set, it reverts to a single line. One additional setting I'd like, different menus for stills and video. Just saying. Set wide and continuous, and soft press to see the speed and coverage of 315 focus points. It's like a swarm of ants on spilled honey. Five focus areas wide, center, which can't be moved, three sizes of flexible spot, and expandable flexible spot. I don't understand the need for simple flexible spot nor for center. Doesn't expandable flexible both cover and improve on those? There's also lock on autofocus, which magically appears in wide and center. Press the center button to start and stop it. Very useful. In continuous, there's expandable lock on autofocus. Again, why? And of course, face detect, which I'd prefer to see as a focus option. Finally, the completely hidden eye autofocus. So let me show you how that works. Set the custom C or trash key, I'd prefer right, but it's not an option there, to IAF. IAF no longer needs to identify a face first. Press the button and wait for the green box. Press the shutter to take the picture. Back to basics. Single center works for the focus and recompose crowd, but sometimes I like to set my focus point. In expandable flexible, Press the center button and use the cursor keys to position it. Straightforward, but once you've used a touchscreen or joystick to set a focus point, this seems so 2015. In aperture or shutter priority, both the lens ring and the control ring adjust the setting. In full manual, the back is shutter, the lens aperture, and here it makes a light clicky sound. Full manual is compatible with auto ISO, which I find useful. Use the fun menu to set ISO 125 to 12.8. 6400 is pretty clear, but try multi-frame auto for the best low light performance. MM at the bottom of the screen is the numerical meter. Multi, center, and locked center spot options. Other manufacturers are adding a highlight meter mode, which I find useful. Press display to see a histogram. For video exposure, there's Zebra, 70 to 100 plus in five-step increments, and two custom settings, standard plus range or lower limit. This is as complete as I've seen anywhere. And I'm starting to like the auto ISO set the minimum, maximum, and in program and aperture modes, the triggering shutter speed threshold. Multiple white balance options, including three custom settings, press right to fine tune. A selection of creative styles. Press right to customize. And here are the full suite of picture effects, including illustration, watercolor, and HDR painting, which are my favorites. I know they're gimmicky, but they do create pretty impressive pictures. If you're planning to vlog, it doesn't have a mic in, but it's a capable video camera, which I demonstrate in another video linked in the top right. There's live HDMI out and a multifunction USB port which can be used with the VPR1 remote to stop, start, and zoom. It's also used to recharge the battery. There's no charger included in the package. If you find battery life short, and the 5 is rated even lower than the 4, it can be powered from the USB port, which I find extremely useful. Video is great, but so many caveats. 4K XAVCS file format, 30 and 24 frame modes at 60 and 100 megabit data rates. 
For 100 megabits, you will need an SDXCU3 rated card. Cycle down to HD, also an XAVCS, and you'll find 60 and 120 frame options. And while 120 can record at 100 megabits, 24, 30, and 60 are limited to 50 megabits. Which is a shame, and means that it's likely preferable to shoot in 4K and down res to HD if it were not for one major limitation. 4K recordings are limited to 5 minutes. Frustratingly, the usual end of recording beep doesn't play when it turns off. There's a pamphlet in the box that warns you to let the camera cool down for several minutes after recording a 5 minute clip. It also warns that the camera may overheat even before the 5 minutes is up. That's a pretty significant limitation, and yes, as promised, even at room temperature, before the five minutes is up, the screen dims and the overheating icon appears. The warning may be a little overprotective. After it appeared, the RX-105 continued to record to the end of the first five minutes, and only near the end of the second five minutes did the countdown start and the auto shutoff happen. The mode dial's HFR setting also records video for slow motion playback. Start on screen 8 to set the HFR exposure mode, I'm going with manual. Then back to screen 2 to set the rate, quality, and timing. There are three record settings and three frame rates, providing combinations from 4 to 40 times slow. As slow increases, resolution and quality decreases. HFR clips are silent and limited to a recording length of about 4 seconds for a playback length at 40 times up to 2.5 minutes. Compose your image and press the center button for standby. This disables just about every function on the camera including zoom. Press the movie button to record. Press the center button again to exit standby mode. Change quality to shoot time to record up to 7.5 seconds playback up to four and a half minutes. The trigger mode can save the recording from the start or after it ends, which is useful. Either way, the longer the final playback, the longer the time it takes to save. I clocked up to five minutes, a mode where the camera is unusable. The RX-105 includes one video specific feature that I find very useful, ND or neutral density. Shooting at an appropriate shutter speed for video, like 1 60th at an ISO of 125, means closing the aperture, and with a maximum of f11, that's often not enough. ND helps. In stills, ND has an auto mode. In video, it's manual. I've added it to the fun menu for quick access. Although they can be used for stills, Sony's picture profiles are an advanced feature for video. To change the camera's response to light, and color. It's kind of a pro video feature, implemented now on nearly all Sony cameras. In my mind, this is all personal taste, but there is some future proofing here. Current HD screens support a display standard called REC or ITU 709. As we transition to 4K with HDR, the new standard is REC 2020, which provides both a wider dynamic range and a larger color palette. Some of the picture profile settings, particularly the gamma and color settings, provide the ability to capture a wider range, but not yet the full 2020. Although the RX-105 only supports S-Log 2 and not 3, and if you want to know more, I have several videos about picture profiles on my channel, one linked in the eye top right, others in the description below. A quick heads up on using Profile 7 or S-Log2 Gamma. First, it forces the ISO to a minimum of 1600. Make sure ND is on. And it makes the video look washed out. Set Gamma Display Adjust to Auto. It will also look washed out on your computer screen. You'll need to make adjustments, color grading, when editing. Here's how I use profiles. For some scenes, I find the default settings too crispy and looking too much like video. So here are the adjustments that I make for a more cinematic look. 
For gamma, cine 1, or 2 for darker scenes, I prefer pro color, although other than S-log there's not much difference. Then I reduce the saturation to minus 2, detail to minus 4. There are literally millions of settings available, so I encourage you to play and test to determine which work best for you. Oh, the menu. Cumbersome is about the only word that describes it. Granted, it exposes an unbelievable feature set, but this could use a makeover, as Sony has done for the A6500 released at the same time. Too many pages, too disorganized, and only occasionally, like here on the HDMI settings, a separate subpage. What I do like is that in many cases you're popped back to an interactive view. For example, when setting picture profiles, the image returns while you make the adjustments. Nice, useful. Playback remains primitive, and it doesn't include a RAW to JPEG conversion or the ability to add picture effect filters in post. Selfie shooters might find the beauty effect settings interesting, adjust skin tone, smooth skin, remove shine, widen eyes, and whiten teeth. That about covers it. Compare before and after and save. And there's the capability to capture a still image from a video. Good data in playback to review your settings. My pet peeve, I can't see the actual file name, only some arbitrary number of images on the card. There's lots more cool and useful stuff, some of it hidden. The monitor has a sunny weather setting, a substantial brightness boost that's very helpful in sunlight, a different brightness boost in the dark, which requires a custom key to activate bright monitoring. In this dark hallway, just look at the exposure setting, it slows the display frame rate to show the scene. Then, there's Auto Dual Record, which automatically takes stills while you shoot video, or press the shutter to take the picture yourself and auto object framing, which saves a second portrait version of an image if it thinks you've done a bad job framing. There's a built-in Wi-Fi hotspot to send photos to a smartphone. Sony's innovation, this is a smart camera with downloadable apps, has yet to be copied by its competitors. Those apps extend the functionality of the camera in several ways, with serious apps that do time-lapse or star trails, and fun apps like touchless shutter and motion capture. They're 10 US dollars or less. Several, like Smart Remote and Best Portrait, are free. You can download them directly from the camera or through a browser on your computer. The RX105 is small. It's tiny size and its menu system compromises the control set, making it somewhat more difficult to access manual features and its extensive catalog of interesting capabilities. That said, there's no faulting its focus engine, burst speed, image quality, or pocketability.